and uh, trust the Lord will give us help as we open up this lovely chapter, one of the loftiest chapters in the New Testament, Ephesians chapter number two. <coughs> Warm welcome to those who are joining on Zoom also. Chapter two of Ephesians, we'll take time to read the whole chapter and we'll discuss as we go along. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace we are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore remember that ye, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircum uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands, that at the time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, he who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the, the saints and the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. I trust the Lord will bless the reading of his word and try and glean out and sift through by sections on what the writer intended. The writer, of course, is the apostle Paul. And Paul is now locationed, likely to be in a jail in the town of Ephesus. And during this particular trip that he made, remember most of Paul's trips, whenever he went to a town, he didn't look for the nearest hotel or the BNB. He was actually on the lookout for the next jail occupancy because he was pretty much going to be arrested either indirectly or directly for creating a riot. And now Paul in this particular occasion here in Ephesus is now writing three, four gospels, four episodes. We have Ephesians, Galatians, Philippians, and likely the book of Philemon. So the writer we know is the apostle Paul. It's likely that he had sent it through Tychicus and maybe Philemon himself had accompanied that somewhere during his house arrest confinement in AD 64. Now, who were the recipients of the book of Ephesians. Now there's some controversy on who exactly would have received it first. Theologians are likely to say that it was a circular letter had gone through many of the assemblies and Ephesus was the last assembly. Be that the case, Ephesus definitely is being mentioned and they have had the privilege of receiving apostles Paul's letter. That, those are the recipients. The region of Ephesus, it's in modern day Turkey, Asia Minor. And we know from past uh, references in the book of Acts that the church was planted in Acts number 19. It was protected in Acts 20. It progresses here in this particular episode. And First Timothy tells us of its preservation. But when you come to Revelation, it talks of its peril. They had lost the first love. 
And maybe that's a salutary warning to any New Testament assembly that we can somehow come under the cold orthodoxy of doctrine and lose the first love. It's not a correcting episode. Paul has no intention like some other episodes, perhaps like Corinthians, where he has to correct them doctrinally and morally. Ephesians is there to set about truth. And so the first three chapters are talking about positional truth. You might have heard that in the last setting when I was with our brother, Mr. Richard Catchpole. And then in the last three chapters, it's talking about the practice of the doctrine that you now imbibed by virtue of the truth that has been set forth. So there's great blessings and wealth of knowledge and truth that has been imparted in the book of Ephesians. And Paul is using the background knowledge that he has, the great repository of information already available to him by the town of Ephesus. And so he draws upon the temple of Diana or Artemis and makes reference to the latter part of the chapter about the temple of God. And then he draws upon the, the workmanship that is uh, already in, in Ephesus. They, they were known to be silversmiths and they had traded in the craft of finery. And so now Paul is now using that to say that you are the, you're not yet the finished article. That we are part of his workmanship and he's the divine master and he's choreographing and engineering and making you into the finished product until ultimately we'll be conformed to the image of God's dear son. So you have the recipients, the region, the reason, the references. And what is the realm? Where does he want to put you to? He's not asking to be stuck here in that which is earth. He's taking us and locking us into heaven where there is security because we are seated in the heavenlies. The range of time, well, if you start from chapter number one, it goes from before the foundation of the world, chapter one, verse four. And then you have in this particular chapter, the dispensation of the fullness of times, verse number 10 of chapter one. Then you have, by the time you come to the next chapter, it is the world without end. And here, what Paul is intending to do is to tell the Ephesian believers the riches that are enjoyed by being in Christ Jesus. He's presenting to them the great mystery that is going to reveal the body of Christ. The sister epistle in Colossians is talking about the head of this particular body. But now for the saints here in Ephesus, he's talking about the body of Christ and the wealth that is being enjoyed there. So if you were to put different headings in the chapters, and I'm sure you've sat through many teachings in Ephesians and listened to many worthy teachers. But maybe what I would like to say, is what has helped me, chapter number one would be his wealth. Chapter number two would be the word that we have here, his workmanship. Chapter number three, we can talk about the wrestling of the belief. Chapter number four, his walk. Chapter number five, the witness. And of course, chapter number six, when it talks about the armor of God, it is the Christian warfare. So how do you divide this chapter? The first 10 verses have a natural break. And you have there that where the believer is now raised and seated on the throne. And from verse number 11 to 22, now it's no, more, no longer being raised and seated. Now we are being reconciled and set into the temple of God. Let's come into the goodness and the joy of salvation, isn't it? It's very easy to get dragged, dragged down into the morass of trouble. And no one is exempt from trouble. But sometimes we need to be reminded, like the psalmist before, oh God, restore unto me the joy of salvation. Let the smile of salvation be evident in the life of a believer, regardless of all the wave after wave of tsunamis that can strike the landscape of our life's experience. And this is a lovely chapter that takes us up, reminding us of where we were saved from and pointing towards where we have been fitted to, fitly framed together. That's the lofty truth that people out there will never be able to appreciate. The world out there with all its clubs and societies and fanciful gatherings do, don't know and never can be aware. Why? Because they are sinners, as Paul introduces us in the first 10 verses. And so in the first 10 verses, we can see perhaps four works. This work of sin against us. That's before we were saved. Then how God works for us. And then how God works in us and God works 
through us. Mind you, everything is in carefully calculated and calibrated precision and detail. The order can never be changed. Sin has always worked against us. Go back to before, just before the moment you were saved. And you, you realize that you were vying and contesting against the enemy of sin and Satan and all his artillery has been directed against you. Because we are sinners by birth, by nature, by habit and by practice. And Paul is reminding them, sin is that deadly enemy. And he says in verse number one, a sinner is dead. That before we were saved, we were all spiritually dead. A dead man can't do anything. He can't understand the gospel until he is awakened to the truth of the knowledge that comes from the preaching of the word. And so let's stick to the preaching of God's word. Do away with anything else, any other thing that will be a, a, a substitute, a decoy, a surrogacy to the plain, simple preaching of God's word and use the Bible to preach. That's the only way that we can proclaim the gospel. And so Paul says that here is a man who's never going to be attracted to any external stimuli. Just like a dead person, when, when someone is clinically dead, what the people there have to do is basically they have to go and certify someone is dead by exerting a few external stimuli. Whether he's brain dead or cardiac dead, he has to not respond to stimuli. And so spiritual deadness means he will not respond to any stimuli. A corpse will not, if you have a funeral service here, that corpse is never going to hear anything that is going to be said about him, regardless of how many accolades we pre tell about. Because that corpse will not be aware. He cannot hear. And so here is a person who is spiritually dead, unaware of what is going to happen to him. And so what happens? Because he is dead, he has been separated from God. Says Isaiah, for your iniquities have separated you from me. And your sins has caused God's face to be far away. And so a dead person will not, will not respond. Now, I'm going to develop the truth as we come along. But we're living in a society in the world where sin has put on the back burner. Sin is not a word that is regularly used. And it has become uh, falsified and substituted. And so the word sin has been replaced by you know, you look at the politician's speech when they're caught red-handed. They usually come up with some words like, you know, it was a moment of weakness, or it was a maladjustment, or it was just a malfunction. The person who has sinned needs to agree what God says about sin. Against thee and thee all have I sinned and done that which is evil in thy sight. And a sinner needs to acknowledge and see himself just as the way God sees him. A thief is now we called an embezzler. A harlot would be called an escort or a woman of the night. Why? Because they have taken and put new labels on the old bottles of poison. And they do not want to direct man to the way God sees him as a sinner. And so it's so important to appreciate when we preach the gospel. Preach Christ. Lift him up on the cross but also alert man to his that dreadful, sinful condition. Only then can the spirit work the way it would. So basically we are living in a graveyard, around a graveyard of sinners. They're all dead corpses, dead people living and walking. The other day someone showed me, um, it was a, a patient of mine, he was an ex-Concord pilot. And he said the last flight he took was to a graveyard in Arizona desert. And that's where they park all the planes, all the old jumbo jets. You don't see any BA jumbo jets anymore. They've all been parked in this massive graveyard in a full-on desert somewhere in the U.S., in the state of Arizona. But remember, far worse than that. And it's a sorry sight to see some majestic flying machines parked there and gone to dereliction and ruin. But look around the society around us. We are living with people actually walking dead. Corpses who never will be alerted to the glorious news of the gospel unless you and I tell it and broadcast it and preach it. 
And so here Paul is saying dead. But not only the fact that he's dead in verse number one, he's also disobedient in verse two to the first part of uh, verse three. If you look at the root cause of sin, it exactly stems from disobedience. When God told Adam and Eve that in the day thou shalt eat of thy fruit, it should, thou shalt surely de- die, and Satan comes and twists that towards it, as he always has done, and says, thou shalt not surely die. That stemmed the root cause of man's sin. And mankind has been catapulted down through the centuries because of the root cause of disobeying God's word. And so he says, you're disobedient. And from then on, as a result of disobedience, what we are fighting against is the three old enemies. The external foe of the world. The internal foe of the flesh. And the infernal foe of the devil. And even as believers, we have to contest that and challenge it every time. The world and its system, the world, the word that is used there, you're very familiar with it, the word called cosmos, the system of the world that formed, that the, the mold that the world wants to put anyone into as it drags its tentacles and impress, puts its impression upon them. That's what Hollywood does. That's what the sports industry does. That's what music and fashion and everything around, around about us that we have to face up to. And so we need to be taking rigorous, rigorous, ruthless action. The internet, your phone, the smart devices, the computer. Take ruthless action and how we do not fall a prey. Many a believer has fallen down. As a result of this, in the privacy of one's room. You know, Proverbs chapter 7, we were reading with our family not that long ago. And uh, it talks about a man, a young man who, uh, who was walking in the twilight zone of the night. And he sees up there, there's a woman there, the harlot, who's trying to snare him. But far more worse than that, it's not the fact that there are, there are uh, suspicious areas here in Maidenhead or wherever you come from. But it's so accessible to us right now. And so, dear child of God, let's do our best to protect ourselves. And mind you, it's not just the young people that are exposed to this. In fact, young people pray for the older generation. Pray for the middle class, middle age generation. Pray for parents and grandparents. Because no one is exempt from the subtlety and the influence and the archery that the devil influences upon. Those whom God has chosen. And whom God has saved marvelously by his precious blood. So the influence of the world. The devil. He talks about the devil here. We were devilish at one stage. Remember that. Now the devil is not omnipresent like God. But the devil can seek to influence people. Through his subtle maneuvers as he has done. Back then the garden of Eden. And twist the truth. He was a liar from the beginning said the Lord. In John's gospel chapter 8. And he uses his influence. To beguile and twist and pervert and invert the truth. And we're living in a society where the truth has been jettisoned for relativism and secularism. And so let's guard it fiercely. And he talks about the flesh, that which is within us, that which is prone. The flesh will never be improved, as the old teachers say, until our bodies are fully redeemed. The flesh is always there. Then came Amalek, says the Old Testament, and smote the hind, hinder part of the nation of Israel. In the moment of weakness, that's when the flesh attacks. And so we need to be taking caution about how we address the three great enemies of God. He talks in verse number three, the second part, not only the fact that he's disobedient and he's dead, now he says he's depraved. The desires of the flesh and the wishes of the mind. That's the literal translation now the fact that a man man is depraved doesn't necessarily mean that he can't do any good it means simply this he will never respond to anything that would merit his salvation you see there are many fine upstanding moral citizens of society out there who are seen to be doing good they think they're doing good uh, just because of the societal influences and the, the upbringing and the environment. So much so that some of them will put Christians to shame. But here Paul is very clear. When, when, when someone has the desires of the flesh and the wishes of the mind, he's utterly and totally depraved. There are people, in fact, the Lord himself says, 
you know, the, 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 there are people who will actually, the, even the sinners of this world, will actually do good in Luke's gospel. But remember, they're just as depraved and dead and disobedient as anyone else. There's no different stages of death. The Lord in his lifetime raised up three people from their death. So there was a girl, little girl, nameless girl, Jairus' daughter, just dead. Her body might be, likely would have been still warm. Widow of Nain's son had been dead. His body would have been cold. Lazarus, out dead, stinking. But they're all corpses. The different states of decay, but they're all dead. There's no one more dead than the other. And so everyone is just as dead and disobedient and depraved. And then the last part of verse 3, it says he's actually doomed. That's what the Lord says. He that believeth not on me is actually condemned already. John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 18. But thank God for that interjection there. <laughs> but God, verse number 4. is now no longer how sin has worked against us. Now is God working for us. There are four things he does. He loves us in verse 4. He quickened us in verse 5. He exalted us in verse 6. And he keeps us in verse 7 to 9. By nature... God is love. Hallelujah for that. God is love. That's something which is intrinsic to the very attribute of God. The intrinsic attributes of God. God is love. God is life. God is holy. These are something that can never be severed. But when you think of the other attributes of God, that's not because of his intrinsic nature. That's what happens when he transfers that or translates that when, when, when he, relative to how he responds to us. So the love of God is manifested by grace and mercy. Three words that we see in the first section. The truth of God is manifested by his righteousness. The life of God is now manifested by his Holiness. And so here you have that which is intrinsic. God's love. Love is a word that has been again misused, isn't it? God's love is uncaused. God's love is unreasonable. We love him because he first loved us. God's love is unending. God's love is unlimited. God's love is unchanging. God's love is uncomplicated. Some people put on their status, it's all complicated when it comes to relationships. Remember, the God that you have come to trust is a love that is unrequiting and unconditional. A love that is pure. A love that is what we call the agape love. We love him because he first loved us. There's nothing worthy in us. But remember, God's grace and God's mercy. You see, we are not saved, and this might come as a shock to you. We are not saved because God is love. We are saved because of his mercy and his grace. We sang that. You see, his mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. His grace is God giving us what we did not deserve. We did deserve hell and eternal damnation. We never deserve salvation. We never deserve the extension of mercy and grace. And as a result of giving us what we do not deserve, his mercy. And as a result of not giving us what we do deserve, his grace. We have peace with God. What a marvelous concept here. And Paul is now funneling that great truth. And talking about his mercy and his grace as a result of the intrinsic attribute of God's love. And what is he doing in verse number five? Not only has he loved us, he's now quickened us. He's made us alive. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing him into the dividing asunder of joints and marrow. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That is why no one, no one can hide from the presence of God. For all things are naked and open unto the eyes of whom we have to do. But then you say, why, why all this? Why does God, why did God love us? And why did God quicken us? And praise be to God the day you got saved. He's doing it because he wants to put us into union with Christ. To lift us and elevate us to such a lofty position. The fact that he's exalted us in verse number six. That we are now joined with the very aristocracy of heaven. 
The fact that we, you and I, I mean, I mean you and I don't need any degrees and accolades and uh, any um, awards from number 10 or from the palace. We've got something far, far greater. That we are heirs and joint heirs with Christ. Could that not be a reminder to us? When we perhaps start our week again on Monday morning. And the world takes us back to its grind. That you are walking in the heavenlies. That's a lovely truth. That we can walk with a head up high and a spring in our step. Regardless of what life might throw at us. And so here we have that he's elevated, exalted us in verse number 6. And just like Lazarus who was raised from the dead. He's now sitting. And dining with the Savior. We should enjoy that. And then he, verse number seven to nine, he says he keeps us. The fact that we are saved is not simply the fact that we are rescued from hell. Glorious as the thought it is. But God had far greater intentions in view. And here we have the church that is developing in chapter three and four. And it's ultimately that we might glorify God's son. If you were there in last um, at the last time, you'll see in chapter 1, there was a recurring phrase in verse number 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace. The fact that you have uh, three other occasions where it's mentioned, verse number 12, again, that we should be to the praise of his glory. Verse number 14, ending with the praise of his glory. That's the ultimate reason why God saves us. And mind you, the grace that saved you is also the grace that keeps you. If you are saved not by good works, you will not be unsaved by bad works. The fact that Noah was saved from the storm by being preserved in the ark, I infer from that is Noah never fell out of the ark. He must have stumbled and fallen in the ark, but he's never lost his salvation. And so here, God's intention is the day he saves you, he will keep you saved. The grace that saved you is also the grace that keeps you saved. Now we come to a little more technical section in verse number eight, one that has drawn a lot of controversy, and I perhaps I'll declare my hand here. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, I don't want to get very technical because I am not technical, but but the the reference that I would use is this. The word therefore by grace. In the Greek, for those of you who enjoy that sort of thing, in the Greek, the word grace is in the feminine. The word saved is masculine. For by grace are he saved through faith. Faith, again, is feminine. And that, now if you look in your margin, and if you have a margin, it'll tell you it's in the neuter. For by grace are he saved through faith and that. Now, Newbury will talk about this salvation through grace by faith. Now, why am I just laboring on that point? It's because the gift of God is salvation. The gift of God is one's salvation. Now, as much as I like the commentator who wrote Ephesians in what the Bible teaches, and I listen to him very often. I've almost listened to him maybe 300 to 365 days. Well, I might have to part ways on this particular passage. Faith is not a gift. Faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Child of God. The fact that you and I have been given salvation is a gift of God. Not a reward of God. It's a free gift. And as a result of that, let's enjoy that. And continue to preach the gospel. And that means as a result of that, that works. I can't add anything to it. Nor dare I take anything from that which has been given to me. There on the cross. Says the poet, I will not work my soul to save for what my Lord has done. But I will work like any slave for the love of God's dear son. That's the important thing. That salvation is purely by grace through faith. The old teachers used to say about it, isn't it? Sola scriptura. Sola gracia. Sola fide. Sola deo. By Christ alone, 
through faith alone, by grace alone, through the scriptures alone. And so you have in the first section, sin that was working against us, God was working for us. And now in chapter 10, chapter 2, verse number 10, and the first part, it says God is working in us, for we are his workmanship created through Christ Jesus. Great, isn't it? That you are part of the finishing product that God has made. His, his beautiful, masterful art that he has formed you. The word there, workmanship, is the word for poem. And poemia, as they call it. And here God is saying, you know, he's still working on you. I might have quoted this poem somewhere else, but pardon me. When God wants to drill a man and thrill a man and skill a man. When God wants to mold a man to play the noblest part. When he yearns within his heart to create so great and bold a man that all the world shall be amazed. Watch his methods. Watch his ways. How he hammers him and hurts him and with mighty blows converts him into trial shapes of clay that God only understands. How he bends but never breaks. When his good he undertakes. How he uses whom he chooses and with every purpose fuses him by direct act induces him to try his splendor out. God knows what he's about. You feeling you're being drilled? You're feeling that you've been weighed down? You're still part of the finished product. Shall not the thing that is formed say the thing that formed it? Why hast thou made me thus? Says Romans chapter 9. No, the vessel that God is using, a vessel that is made unto honor, God still has the authority and the right and the prerogative. If the vessel is marred in his hand, Jeremiah 18, he will form it another vessel. Another that will be used for his glory. He's not going to discard it. Praise God, you're not part of the potter's field, that you're not just mere dust. Nor are you part of the potter's gate in chapter 19 of Jeremiah, where you're smashing the smithereens. God has allowed the, 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 the tempestuous waves that make dust into clay to form you. And you are part of his workmanship that God will use ultimately for the greater good of his glory and for the betterment of the local assembly and ultimately for the honor of his son. So that's how God is working in us. And then you have God working through us in the second part of uh, chapter 10. Uh, sorry, chapter 2, verse number 10. We are not saved by good works, but saved unto good works. Sometimes, you know, a believer has to go through suffering. You see, th the way that we respond on a daily basis is three. You have the word of God. You have your communion with God. And then you have the life's experiences. The word of God is what we call as the logos. God speaking through his word. But then you have what we call the rima. That God's word is speaking through me. So while you read the word of God this morning. What have you taken out from God's word. Which is making applicable to you. I used to often struggle with this as a teenager. After I got saved. And you know, people used to maybe mention it. Privately or in public, you know, this is what God spoke to me. And I thought, how outlandish is that? How can God speak to you? Man, God, this word of God is there. But actually, when you spend time with God's word, I hope you've read the word of God this morning. And mind, it's a good thing to read it on your knees. Best exercise possible. Free advice for you. <laughs> Just bend your knees. That's the best time your knees are being nourished and all the cartilages are being encouraged to replenish. But that's a side point. But bend... And then pray. Pray and communicate with God. And then when life throws what it has to you, what does it do? It drives you back to the word of God. It drives you back. This is one great cycle there for a believer. Reading the word, spending time in prayer, and facing life as what life wants to give it to you. And so here you have, God is working through us. And that's how it is all through, all through the Old Testament history and the New Testament. You look at Moses. Moses there in the 40 years in the, in the palace, Prepared in the desert so that he can come back. God used the suffering of the desert and humbled them. The one who was uh, uh, associated with the, the hoity-toity of the palaces now had to be humbled and brought low to understand the shepherd experience in the backside of a desert. Joseph, with the reverse. Joseph is now in the desert and then he's brought in the palace, but he's still being taught. Saul of Tarsus had to spend three years in Arabia just to be taught. David, the sweet singer of Israel, the sweet psalmist, Although he was anointed in his youth, he's there being prepared, running away from Saul, running away from into exile. 
so that God is preparing him, so that he will be a great king, a mighty king. And so God is using and working through us. But when you come to the next section, and my time is speedily going by. So if in the first section you have from the grave and you're raised and seated in the heavenlies or on the throne, in the second section you have from grace and you're reconciled and set into the temple. Grave and grace. Sometimes we forget to take off our grave clothes and adorn the grace clothes. And it's very easy to get attached to the old clothes. That is why when the, the, the Lord raised up Lazarus, he could have just as well rolled away the stone and just as well unraveled him. The power that was used to resurrect Lazarus, he used someone else and the people out there to unravel. You know, the Christian New Testament assembly should be filled with people who are stone rollers and grave clothes un uh, unwrappers. It's important. That's part of the, the, the discipling process when someone gets saved. That you and I get involved in helping them on their Christian journey. And so now we have the word grace and mercy in the first verses. But now in the, the, the next section from 11 to 22, you have the word peace. And what is happening? This is now the Apostle Paul introducing the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ himself is on a great peace mission. It is said that right through the last 2,500 years, even before Christ, there have been at least some 6,000 peace treaties. All of them have miserably failed. One peace treaty that is standing and will stand unto eternity is the peace that God has made through his son. That eternal covenant that he has bestowed us with. And so you have in this particular section, you have the separation, what the Gentiles were, verse, uh, verses 11 to 12. Then you have reconciliation, what God did for the Gentiles, verses 13 to 18. And then you have unification, what the Jew and Gentile are in Christ in the last three verses. So here we have now the separation. What were the Gentiles before they were saved? What was happening is basically this. Paul is now discussing salvation of the sinners in general, but now he's specifically concentrating on Gentiles. Why? Because the Ephesian church was pretty much comprised of Gentiles. Gentiles who converted and came into the faith, into the saving knowledge of faith. And what Paul is saying is you didn't have to become a Jew to do that. You didn't have to proselytize and become a Jew in order to then become a Christian. No, you bypassed all that. The, for centuries, the Jews had looked down on the uncircumcised Gentiles. And it was never God's, God's intent to do that. When God called out Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12, and he took him out sovereignly, it was his purpose to bless all the nations, not just the Jewish nation. But he was using the nation of Israel as a vehicle and a conduit to bless all the other nations. But what did they do? They started isolating themselves morally and politically and racially and basically looking down. The noses of the heathen nation. And guess what? Also, the fact that they then started isolating, not only isolating, but they started identifying with the nations around them. And so God's plans was to put Israel on the siding. And now this marvelous work that he's going to do. And bringing in Gentiles, that's why you and I have come into the good home. Bringing in Jew and Gentile. And bringing them into that which is not a continuation of the nation of Israel. It's an entirely different organism, the church, which is his body. And here we have now what Paul is describing in this, in this section on the separation that we were once without Christ. We were without a citizenship. We were without any covenants. We were without hope and we were without God, without Christ. Living in an area called Ephesus where there were a pantheon of gods. Diana, the temple, and the race to the benefit of Artemis. And they knew what it was. All the pagans down there. In fact, you know, this is, the, this is how uh, Christendom has formed. Christendom, which is the amalgamation of the church and the kingdom. That's how they constantly brought it together. This monstrosity that was formed back in 333 AD. Just to suit the whims and fancies of the state and the church. And here now... Paul is now saying, knowing fully well 
that the Spirit of God is being revealed to him that there will be Gnostic teachers coming to assault this doctrine of the church. And Paul says, now, once upon a time, you were without Christ in this world, living in a Christless, Christless state. But also the fact that you were without a citizenship. And he builds into the fact that while there was a law and the blessing given to the Jewish nation, nothing given to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles thought they were going to be, in order for them to become a Christian, they have to proselytize and they have to somehow weave themselves into the fabric and the warp and woof of Judaism before they become a Christian. We were reading in our recent Bible readings in John chapter 12. And you might remember the incident where the Jews, uh, sorry, the Greeks came and approached Philip and said that, sirs, that was a desire. Sirs, we would want to see Jesus. You see, they had heard about it. They had perhaps heard all the, all the, um, the, the festivals and the feasts that were taking place. And somehow they knew something is going to happen. And perhaps that was the first fruits of a great global harvest. That's how God works, isn't it? Acts chapter 16. I see Lydia, a damsel who's been saved, saved from the powers of Python and spirits of divinity and, the, and Cornelius. Oh, sorry, I beg with the Philippine jailer. God, when he operates... In total contradiction to what the Jewish pharisaical mind had in mind. Every morning he gets up, this is what he prays. The rabbinical Jew stands up to pray three things. God, I thank you I'm not a Gentile. God, I thank thee that I'm not a woman. God, I thank thee I'm not a slave. And in one chapter, God turns the whole thing on its head. The first woman to be saved in Europe. Lydia, a seller of pearl. A damsel who's a slave sold to the powers that be. Who tried to prostitute her. And God uses the apostle Paul and Silas. A slave, a woman, and a Gentile to start the church in Philippi. That's what God works. And so you have now without Christ, without citizenship, without any common covenants. Covenant of the covenant being established in the nation of Israel. Starting from Noah and the Mosaic covenant, the Dominic covenant. All unilaterally a pledge given by God for the nation of Israel. What did they do? They fought it every covenant systematically. Not a single covenant given to the Gentiles. And guess what? We've been brought into covenant blessing. We were without hope. You think of the times these people are living in. The really dark, dark phase of life. Philosophy is all empty. And, and basically, there's nothing to look forward to. Everything was shaky. And here is now Paul saying, you are also without God. And into all the spiritual plight that they were, they had been drowning into. Now man thinks of a story of evolution. This was actual devolution. They were just going into spiritual decline and decline. And here says Paul in uh, verse 13 to 18. This is what God did for the Gentiles. We who were once enemies with God, he reconciled. He brought us together. And the enmity that was not only there between the Jew and the Gentile, but also between the sinner and God. Has now been reconciled. What a lofty truth. Reconciled. You know, I had a, I remember some time back, a, um, a Polish friend of mine who goes as a gardener uh, has come to our meetings and uh, he was going through a difficult time with his wife. And um, his wife was a nurse working in the surgery where my wife used to work. And in his broken English, um, he says that they were going for some counseling. And he said, I basically, we are going for a recancellation. I thought, actually, he got it right, isn't it? That's reconciliation. To put away all the false thoughts and be brought together and Jew and Gentile being brought together and being fitly framed into the body of Christ. And that's what is happening. Just remember, just before I quickly summarize. So our old position, the new position. The old position Paul has established, we were without Christ. Now in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13, we are in Christ. We were aliens in the old position. We are now a holy nation, says Peter. A holy nation, a peculiar priesthood, and so on and so forth. We were strangers. And verse number 19, we are no more strangers. We were without hope. And chapter 4, verse 4, we'll talk, talk, it'll talk about being called into one hope. And finally, we were without God. And Ephesians chapter 1 actually introduces us to the fact that it's the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. My time is up. Just finally, the unification, what Jews and Gentiles are in Christ. And Paul labors on the point, you're one new man, one body, one spirit, 
and all the spiritual distance and divisions have been eliminated and we are brought together. Ultimately, how does he construct it? We are one nation. Not Israel, the chosen nation. It is one nation. They rejected the Redeemer. They made that spot the greatest crime scene this world has ever seen. And they put your Savior and mine on the cross. But we were responsible for that also. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is upon him. And with his stripes, we now have been healed. So one nation together. It's marvelous, isn't it, that from stepping out of the ark where three sons and you and I have pretty much descended from them, isn't it? So from Shem comes Saul of Tarsus, the Semite. From Ham comes all the, uh, from came the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8 and every descendant in the Middle East and Africa. And from Japheth comes Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. That pretty much includes you and me, the Indo-European race. And so God had this marvelous plan that in the New Testament, he'll fulfill that which he had promised to Abraham, that in thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And so we have one nation, one family. The New Testament assembly is your family. It's the safest haven a believer can have. And let's keep it that way. Let's avoid any differences of opinion. Let's, you know, all of the things should grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And then you have one temple and that is the temple of God. You know, God always desired that he will dwell with man. And so he wanted to walk with man in the first book of first few chapters of Genesis. You have Enoch walking with God. He wanted to dwell with his people in Exodus. And then you have the, the tab tabernacle there. You come to Kings, you have the, he wanted to live, live with his people in the temple. And then you have in John's gospel chapter one, the word was made flesh and tabernacle amongst us. He dwelt in the body of Christ and we put him to a cross. And by the time we now come to this great foundational truth, it is Jesus Christ, the foundation, the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone that has united you, Jews and Gentiles, and the middle one of partition has been uh, broken. There's no difference. We're all one. There's no racial segregation. There's only one race, the human race. And here we have now that temple will fitly framed together as the body of Christ. And once you come to realize that, then, well, like John Newton, as we sung at the beginning, we'll be able to say, amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Once lost, now I'm found. It's blind that now I see. John Newton's story of salvation for you young people out there is great. It's just well worth a good bed night, bedtime reading. Lived in debauchery. He was a slave of the slaves. Sailing on this ship that his father had left him. His father had basically forsaken his mother. His mother was a godly woman. Praise God for godly women who spend time on their knees. Mothers and grandmothers, spend time on your knees for your children and your grandchildren. And John Newton, living this life of debauchery and sunk so low, went on this journey to Africa. And a huge wave swept him off the deck of the ship. And he was cast into the perilous ocean on the briny waves of the Atlantic until he cried out, Lord, save me. And, uh, and if history has to believe, be believed, a wave swept him back on the deck. And some faithful sailors out there gave him a book by Thomas A. Kempis on the person of Christ. And young John Newton got marvelously saved. He went on to say, I'm not what I used to be. I'm not what I once was. But praise God, I am what I am. That's what you are. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not of words. Lest any man should boast. May the Lord bless us.